Good morning. Good to see you this morning at uh, our sermon on YouTube. Bethel Gospel Chapel's sermon over YouTube is a, is, a, is a good platform in the absence of being able to get together. Our sermon today will focus on Isaiah 53. It's the last in our series on Isaiah 53, which Randy Bushy, a teaching elder here at Bethel, has been presenting. We're going to focus today on verses 10 through 12. We appreciate how much Isaiah has revealed to us, and this morning's sermon will we'll concentrate on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, or the resurrection of the suffering servant, as we've come to know him so well through this series. As many of you know, we have been meeting for the Lord's Supper on Sunday mornings using the Zoom platform, beginning at 9.30. And we've also been offering a sermon, a sermon over YouTube at 11, as you're tuning into now. We understand uh, that there are announcements forthcoming from the Ontario government uh, sometime tomorrow, which may affect us. If it proves that there is a relaxation of current restrictions, uh, we will, of course, resume as soon as it's practical to get back together again. And we'll keep you posted on, on developments in that regard. A reminder that prayer meetings are taking place uh, each week over Zoom with women's prayer meetings on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. in the evening over Zoom and men's at 7 a.m. in the morning on Friday. If you'd like to join us, and we'd love to have you uh, join along with us, we are, please uh, let Randy or Pat know and they'll be sure to add your name to the email list that goes out each week to invite us to link in to Zoom on that particular morning. Good morning. We're going to read again Isaiah 53. So if you have your Bibles, please turn there. I'm going to be reading from the ESV. Again, Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken up for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich man in his death although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. And when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The Lord, the will of the Lord, shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your continued protection over us. We are a thankful people, too, for the love you have for us and for sending Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, to be a propitiation for our sins. Thank you, too, Father, for the Bible and for the fact that we have it so readily available to us and, and also that we have this platform to hear your word declared and to see Christ exalted, the one who is the suffering servant, spoken of by your prophet, Isaiah. 
I would ask that, as we settle in to hear this sermon, that your Spirit would give us listening ears and help us to help to make us teachable, that we might learn from your word and that we might ask ourselves, uh, what is it that I ought to do to become more like my Savior, more like Jesus? We would ask, too, to, that you would bless the many who are part of the church at Bethel, especially in these what are difficult times. Many of us, Father, are wearying of the conditions under which we've been living and you know that our deep desire is to be together. And so we would ask that you would be the one who would guide those who are in authority over us and that as they make decisions, they would do so in their role as governors in wanting to do the right thing by us all. Thank you for the Lord Jesus and bless us now in his name and bless too Randy's uh, preparations and, and sermon that we'll, we'll settle in and listen to now. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Hello Bethel. This is our fifth and final segment on Isaiah 53 and it, uh, it occurs on what is the fifth anniversary of our time in this building. February 7th 2016 was our first Sunday here at Tackerberry. So it's a little surreal for Jake and me being here alone in the building on this anniversary, but we're looking forward to being with all of you very soon. We're looking at Isaiah 53 this morning, and before we look at the text, verses 10, 11, and 12, let's do a quick history lesson. Back to the first century, four decades after the crucifixion of Christ, in 70 AD, the Roman army sieged Jerusalem. They surrounded the city in April, April the 14th, which coincided with Passover that year. And for four months, the siege went on as they tried to um, squeeze the resources out of the city so that the people would have to let them in. It was four months because they finally breached the wall in August that summer, 70 AD, and on September the 8th, the job was completed. It was mopping up, operation was over, the holy temple was destroyed, the holy city was destroyed, and the nation of Israel was destroyed. It was a foreshadowing in a sense of the Holocaust because one million Jews died at that occasion and 97,000 others were taken into slavery. But the reason I tell you all of that is because at that point, the Hebrew language went into massive decline. And in the third to fifth centuries, it was largely lost. There were pockets of survival of the Hebrew language through to, to medieval times in rabbinic literature and in some poetry, in Jewish religious liturgy, even in Jewish intra-commerce uh, between Jewish people. But the language continued to be, for most, the most part, a lost language. And so therefore, Jews and Gentiles alike were shocked when in 1948, on May the 15th, when the nation of Israel was declared to be a new independent Israel, that the government declared that the official languages of this nation would be Arabic and Hebrew, the formerly lost language. And then two and a half years ago, the government of Israel declared that Hebrew was the sole national official language. There's an irony there because for many Jews, they always read their Bible, the Tanakh, our Old Testament, in Hebrew. Hebrew was considered to be a sacred language, a holy language. But for the many Jews outside of Israel, they even today can't understand the Hebrew language. In a sense, they're prevented from reading the Bible in their own language. They rather prefer to read it in Hebrew, the holy language, even though they don't understand it, rather than reading it in English or their own language that they do understand. And so today, as a consequence, most Jews do not know their Old Testament, their Tanakh, their Bible. In this final segment of our series, verses 10 to 12, in the Gospel according to Isaiah 53, we're reminded that this is a piece of Hebrew poetry written in the 8th century BC. 
This is the fifth stanza. Remember we said that the final verses of Isaiah chapter 52 form the first stanza or strophe or cameo. And this is now the fifth. This is a poem of the suffering servant, the Messiah. And I realize that as we read through this passage and study this text, it's a little bit like drinking from a fire hose, isn't it? Isaiah is attempting to express the inexpressible. And I'll post a blog this week where we talk about Isaiah 53 and its references in the New Testament. Because some are implicit, some are explicit. There are quotes and echoes and allusions. But there are 50 times when Isaiah 53 is mentioned in the New Testament text. And the purpose for, what Isaiah, for which Isaiah wrote was that people of all generations would recognize the Messiah, would identify his mission, they would understand his purpose. And that brings us to verse 10. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. And verse 10 says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. The New King James Version says it this way, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Talking of the suffering Messiah. The New International Version, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. In the Hebrew language, the first translated word of verse 10 is the word kafetz, which can be translated as delight or please, desire or will. But it's preceded by the Hebrew disjunctive providing the term yet. So literally the translation would be yet delight. But the words that follow don't sound very much like anything delightful. Why would it please the Father that the Son, the Messiah, the suffering servant, would be crushed? That really helps us to understand as we think about the answer to that question about what the gospel is. Because the gospel, before the creation of the world, the triune God devised a plan of salvation. God recognizing that our sin uh, was so grievous, so repugnant, so criminal, that it would re require the sacrifice of the perfect Lamb of God. And the Father was pleased and delighted not to torture His Son, but He was pleased and delighted that His will was carried out in His Son for our salvation. Crucifixion was invented by the Romans to be the most painful, degrading form of execution. Excruciating is a term that means out of the cross. And the events of the cross of Christ are not just unpleasant, but they are downright extremely violent, hostile, horrific, cruel, and bloody. One of the great ironies of history was pointed out by historian and Bible teacher Kenneth Bailey. Here's what he said. At the cross, the finest religion of the ancient world, Judaism, and the finest system of justice of the ancient world, Rome, joined to torture this good man to death. They were the best institutions the ancient world had to offer, and yet together they produced the cross. It was intentionally sadistic on the part of Christ's tormentors and adversaries that they would inflict on him this extreme physical pain and dishonor, and disgrace, and shame, and indignity. But I think that was probably nothing to him compared with the psychological and relational trauma and pain of his father turning his back on him as he hung on the cross. The eternal love relationship that the son had with his father was temporarily severed. The lights went out for three hours, from noon to three o'clock in the middle of a Middle Eastern day. But his suffering was necessary, and it demonstrates the gravity of our sin. That's what Isaiah is saying. Verse 10, Yet it was the will of the Father to crush him. He, the Father, has put him, the Son, to grief. And so our conclusion from this text is that Messiah, 700 years later, was killed ultimately not by the Jews or the Romans, he was killed not ultimately by Caiaphas or Pilate or Judas or even Satan. 
but he was killed by God. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. And verse 10 continues. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. I wonder if Isaiah felt confused, conflicted as he wrote those words. I wonder if he questioned the coherence of what he was even writing. Because if you think back to last week in verse 8, we studied, for he was cut off from the land of the living. And we said that the Hebrew word there indicates a dramatic death. Verse 9, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich in his death. And now here in verse 10, when his soul makes an offering for guilt, and Isaiah and every other Jew knew that a guilt offering was a slaughtered animal. But we see through Isaiah's pen in these words something that I don't think he could have possibly understood. Here in this text, we see glimmers of the resurrection of Christ. The suffering servant dies, and yet here in verse 10, it says, he shall see his offspring, referring to the spiritual sons and daughters of the Messiah. He shall prolong his days. How do you prolong your days after death? And how does the will of the Lord prosper in his hand? That's the language of the living. That's the terminology of resurrection. And so he continues in verse 11. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. The suffering servant was satisfied or fulfilled, gratified, because his sacrificial death is now behind him and he is raised to life never to die again. How could Isaiah get that so precisely right? How could Isaiah, writing seven centuries before Christ, be so exact? That feature, this precise prediction, as if Isaiah was standing as a witness at the foot of the cross, is one of the things that led Mitch Glazer, the man we talked about last week, to faith in Christ, and many other Jews as well. But some have said, well, maybe that was really inserted into the text after the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Sure, Isaiah wrote seven centuries before Christ, but maybe Isaiah 53 was inserted after the time of Christ. After all, for many, many, many years, the oldest copy we had, the oldest handwritten copy in the form of a scroll of Isaiah 53, of the whole book of Isaiah, was almost 900 years after the life of Christ. So maybe somebody just inserted Isaiah 53 in there. Every um, fulfilled biblical prophecy is explained away in some way by someone who cannot accept that God predicts and God reveals the future before it happens. But you can't do that with Isaiah 53. Because in 1946, some Bedouin shepherds began to discover scrolls in earthen jars, in caves in Qumran. And the picture you saw on the screen is of cave number four, where the majority of documents were found. But in cave number one was the greatest single find of all of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the entire book of Isaiah, all 66 chapters. 17 sheets of parchment stitched together, 24 feet long, 54 columns of text, and what's notable about the Isaiah scroll, the great Isaiah scroll, is it's the only scroll of all the Dead Sea Scrolls preserved almost perfectly. Now, here's the thing. Before the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest scroll was about 900 AD, dated to almost 900 years after the life of Christ. This Dead Sea Scroll has been dated a thousand years earlier between 100 and 200 years before Christ. And guess what? Isaiah 53 is, of course, included word for word in that Dead Sea Scroll. It's the centerpiece of the museum called the Shrine of the Book. And uh, the picture on your screen of that lid is the, the top or the roof of that museum, most of which is underground. 
the lid is to look like the jar from which the scroll was extracted. And the next slide shows you the Isaiah 53 scroll. It's probably a replica. It's not the real thing. It's too valuable. Encased under heavy glass in the center of that museum. But the I text of Isaiah 53 continues to be excluded from the weekly Haftarah readings in every synagogue in the world. It's been noted by Jewish people that Isaiah 52 is read and Isaiah 54 is read, but never is Isaiah 53 read. Verse 11. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. The suffering servant goes beyond just bearing the iniquities of his people because the gospel says that the suffering servant transforms their character. The suffering servant takes his people and makes them righteous. They are accounted as being righteous. We call that justification. And it also involves the concept of imputation that we talked about in recent weeks where on the cross, the suffering servant bore my sin. My sin was charged to his account and his righteousness was credited to my account or to the account of any person who embraces Christ, receives Christ by faith. That's what Romans 3 and 4 talk about. Chapters 3 and 4 of Romans talk about the fact that in addition to slowly, incrementally, sanctifyingly transforming his followers to be more like him, the Lord Jesus, not in the Supreme Court of Canada, not in the International Court at The Hague, but in the cosmic, universal court of all of heaven, declares His people righteous. And the result is that those of us who place our faith in Christ are guaranteed wholeness and spiritual health and an eternal relationship with the God of Israel, Yahweh. Now the question might be, but isn't this a, a blatant violation of justice? How can the suffering servant uh, protect and transform and declare righteous somebody who clearly isn't? How is that just? That brings us back to the concept that we've talked about the last two weeks as well. Penal substitutionary atonement. At the heart of the covenant between God and Israel, that was mediated through Moses on top of Mount Sinai, at the heart of the Gospel of the New Testament, at the heart of Isaiah 53, is this concept of penal substitutionary atonement. One, the suffering servant, is penalized. He's punished with pain. Two, he is the one who is to atone, to make right, to make restitution for those who have offended God. Number three, he is the substitute, Christ in my place. Verse 12 says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many. Notice the change of pronouns here. I will divide him a portion with the many. God the Father is speaking here, and he, speaking in the first person, did so at the beginning of this poem and does here at the end. Do you remember back in... Chapter 52, verse 13, in the first verse, the first segment in our first session together, we read this verse, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. And now here in verse 53, chapter 53, verse 11, my righteous servant will justify many. And in verse 12, therefore I will give him a portion among the great. So God the Father speaks bookending this poem, at the beginning of the poem and here at the end. Back to verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Here, clearly, in the last verse of this poem, the suffering servant is rewarded after death, but he's rewarded as an active participant. How can that be? 
he must be resurrected for this verse to make any sense. For the, this section, this fifth strophe, this fifth uh, stanza to make any sense must talk about the resurrection of Christ. And there's another word here that I want us to take a look at. It's the Hebrew word rob. And it's used five times in this song. Here's what the word means. Many or more. It sometimes can be translated great or mighty or abundant. The wide-ranging, astonishing, immeasurable, cosmic success of the servant's atonement is what is talked about here. And if you go all the way back to chapter 52, verse 14, here's the word, as many were astonished at you. Verse 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations. And now here, near the end in verse 11, my righteous servant will justify many. And then in verse 12, give him a portion among the many. And again, he bore the sins of many. Who are the many who will be considered great? Who are they? What's their identification? Well, here Isaiah is talking about those who respond in faith to the person and the work of the suffering servant. Jew and Gentile, male and female, child and adult, from every nation, from every era. The gospel is the proclamation of the good news of the person and work of Christ and the eternal benefit to any person responding in repentance and faith. But even with this powerful evidence that we've looked at over these five weeks, the resurrection of Christ, and there's powerful historical evidence to support the fact that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead on the third day. Or what about the control and the direction over the history and the destiny of the Jewish people? That this nation that was destroyed in 70 AD would be reformatted as a powerful nation, having to defend itself almost from the beginning of its rebirth in 1948, to being a significant player on the geopolitical stage today. Or what about the predictive power of Bible prophecy, including this literary treasure, Isaiah 53, proclaiming the person and the work of the suffering servant. The only way a person can respond to the gospel is when the Spirit of God opens that person's eyes. Otherwise, people can understand the truth of this and still walk away, saying it means nothing to me. But when the Spirit of God opens somebody's eyes, they realize the eternal power and truth of the gospel. Noam Cohen is an example of that. That's his picture on the screen now. He's an unusual Jew in that many Jews were born elsewhere and chose during their lifetime, at the end of the 20th century or early in the 21st century, to move back to Israel. He did the reverse. He was born in Jerusalem and he decided that he was going to move to Japan to study martial arts. And he was there for almost two decades. Through a series of events, in his mid-40s, he decided to come back to Jerusalem, back to Israel. But he did so without his wife. His money was gone. His life direction was gone. And he was working in a shop near the Dead Sea when he met a Christian woman. And she talked to him about the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And here were his words. What's going on here? She's a Christian. I'm the Jew. How come she's using the name of my God? And then he went on to say to her, how come you know my God and I don't? Through a series of conversations, she gave him a copy of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament in English and Hebrew. And as he read, the Spirit of God opened his eyes to the truth of the gospel. And quite fittingly, one day, he dropped to his knees in a parking lot behind the King David Hotel in Old Jerusalem and received Christ. I've got one takeaway for you from this session this morning and really for the whole series. The Gospel according to Isaiah 53, in our first week together, we stated that the purpose of this study, 
was that for all of us, our intention was that the capacity to treasure Christ and to love the Lord Jesus would grow as we studied this text. When you think about it, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 is the ultimate rags to riches story. The suffering servant who is so violently killed becomes the king of kings. He becomes the Lord of lords. He's the ultimate ruler of the entire universe. And there will come a day when he is recognized as such because the Bible tells us in Philippians 2 that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's really a riches to rags to riches story when you consider the incarnation because God the Son left the luxury of heaven. That's what the Bible tells us. This unimaginable wealth of heaven. He left that to take on humanity, to come to earth where he would be rejected and despised and scorned and tortured and killed. When he was in heaven, he was eternally loved. He was eternally respected. And he came to earth to be rejected and scorned, to become the suffering servant. So why do we need a suffering servant? Why did the suffering servant in the plan of redemption even have to exist? Again, Isaiah is expressing the inexpressible. But he's been teaching us through this text that God's wrath is targeted at any one of us who has ever sinned. And therefore, we need protection. We need protection from that wrath, or we stand in danger of being separated from Him forever. One God, expressed in three persons, had a plan before the creation of the universe. And that was Christ in my place. Now, this calls for careful thinking. When we understand who God is, when we understand the concept of the gospel, the gospel really is God saving me from God. God is just. God is also loving. God's wrath is targeted at sin. And yet the gospel says that Christ, who is God, shouldered my, shouldered our punishment on himself. That's the gospel of Isaiah 53. But the Gospel of Isaiah 53 contains another rags to riches story. And it's the story of wandering sheep who are really hardened rebels, defiantly and arrogantly rejecting God and His authority, brushing off His authority, breaching His law, hating His person. But because of the suffering servant's provision, when we humble ourselves, when we submit to Him, when we love Him, the Bible says that we become eternally healed and transformed and declared righteous. The Bible talks about Christ's likeness, meaning that we are changed. The Bible calls that sanctification. We are changed to forever be like Christ. And if that doesn't make us as we read this text, value Christ more highly, then I don't know what possibly could. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, the gospel for every person, Jew or Gentile, from days of old to our contemporary day, is Christ in my place. May those of us who have never yet come to faith in Christ recognize the truth of that and have our eyes opened, our spiritual eyes, the eyes of our heart, opened by the Spirit of God. For those of us who have come to that realization, who have entered into a relationship with Almighty God through Christ, may we grow to love and treasure Him more when we think about who He is and what He's done for us. We pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning.